Cleft lip and palate are malformations of the face that form as the embryo is developing, usually by the 35th day after conception. These malformations occur when the maxillary and median nasal structures fail to fuse. Failure to fuse creates an abnormal opening or cleft in the child's lip and or palate. Cleft lip is more common in males, while cleft palate is more common in females. These disorders are most common among Asians and Native Americans and are least common among African Americans. The cause of cleft lip and palate is not known. However, there are risk factors. Genetics may play a role, so the risk increases when there is a family history of clefts. Another important risk factor is exposure to teratogens. That's anything that can adversely affect how cells develop in an embryo or fetus. Teratogens include radiation, intrauterine viral infections, some chemicals, and certain medications that pregnant women might take. For example, the risk may increase if the mother ingests excessive amounts of alcohol when pregnant, or takes phenytoin, trade name Dilantin, or diazepam, trade name Valium. Diagnostic procedures and laboratory tests for cleft lip and palate include prenatal ultrasound, history of the pregnancy, physical examination of the child's mouth, CBC, and electrolytes. Wound and sputum cultures are done when maternal infection is suspected. Cleft lip can be unilateral or bilateral. It varies from a simple notching of the pigmented portion of the lip to a deep cleft that extends through the lip or into the nose. Infants with cleft lip typically have difficulty feeding. Cleft palate involves a fissure or an opening in the hard and or soft palate areas. This opening makes it difficult for the child to suck. The child will often cough and choke when trying to feed. Children with these defects experience persistent feeding problems that can result in complications. Eventually, the child may lose weight, develop nutritional deficiencies, have fluid and electrolyte imbalances, and fail to thrive. Many parents feel guilty or distressed by their child's condition. They may believe that the malformation is their fault. In addition, a sense of loss of the child they imagine can make it difficult for them to bond with the child. On the other hand, parents who have had a cleft repair themselves or have other children or family members with successful surgical repair of clefts might be very well prepared to cope with the situation. To correct cleft lip and palate, the child must undergo surgical repair and reconstruction. The process begins when the child is an infant and may continue into adulthood. Surgery for cleft lip is usually performed when the child is about three months old, while closure of a cleft palate might be done when the child is around one year old. Many nursing diagnoses are important both before and after surgery. Preoperative nursing diagnoses include altered nutrition, less than body requirements related to feeding difficulties, altered parent-infant attachment related to parental feelings of guilt or loss, altered growth and development related to altered nutrition, and fluid volume deficit related to difficulty with sucking. Postoperative nursing diagnosis can include pain related to the surgical intervention, altered family processes related to stresses due to surgery, and a risk of injury and infection to the surgical site related to the surgical repair. For surgery to be successful, the child should be well cared for, adequately nourished, and in good general health prior to the procedure. Work closely with the parents during the preoperative period to foster parent-infant bonding. Encourage parents to participate in the child's care as soon as possible after birth. When they feel ready, parents should hold and feed their baby. Help parents deal with any feelings of guilt they might have. Reassure them that they have done nothing wrong and that their child's malformation can be surgically corrected. It might help to show the parents some photographs of children before and after reconstructive surgery. You can also refer them to a support group where they can talk with other families who have had children with this problem. A helpful resource is the Cleft Palate Foundation. To promote good nutrition preoperatively, teach caregivers how to feed the child. To keep the infant from aspirating during feeding, instruct parents to hold the child in an upright position. Some children with cleft lip or palate may be able to breastfeed. However, if breastfeeding is not successful, the mother should then use a breast pump to express the milk and begin bottle feeding the expressed milk to the child. Parents can first try to feed the baby with a regular bottle and nipple. However, if the child has difficulty sucking, parents will need to use special feeding devices. One method for feeding is called the Enlarge, Stimulate, Swallow, and Rest, ESSR, method. The first step in ESSR is to enlarge the nipple by cutting a cross in the nipple. 
Enlarging the nipple minimizes the baby's sucking problem by allowing fluid to flow more easily into the back of the child's throat. The next step is to stimulate the sucking reflex. The caregiver should stroke the infant's lower lip with the nipple, then insert the nipple into the infant's mouth, invert the bottle, and direct the fluid to the back of the mouth. The infant will then swallow the fluid. After swallowing, let the child rest and then start the process again. Remind the caretaker to burp the child often throughout the feeding. Infants with this malformation tend to swallow large amounts of air. If using standard nipples is not successful, there are other feeding devices available such as cleft palate nipples and preemie nipples. You can also use an aseptic syringe with a rubber tip for feeding. Following feeding, place the child on his side with the head of the crib elevated. To maintain a clear airway, teach the family how to use a bulb syringe to suction the child's mouth gently. During the immediate preoperative period, tell parents what to expect during the early postoperative period. For example, have them feed the child with the same type of feeding device that will be used after surgery. Following surgery, the primary goal is to protect the operative site from injury. Use elbow restraints to prevent trauma to the incision and to keep the child from touching the area. Remember to remove restraints one at a time for approximately 10 minutes at least four times each day. Remember not to put hard objects in the child's mouth until the oral cavity has healed completely. This includes thermometers, suction catheters, straws, tongue depressors, spoons, and ice chips. Be sure the parents understand this as well. Following repair of a cleft lip, prevent tension on the suture line and damage to the site. A Logan bow, which is a narrow metal strip, may be positioned over the infant's upper lip and secured with tape. Pain management is also important following surgery. Observe for infant crying and restlessness and other indicators of pain. Postoperative pain medication is generally administered via the oral or intravenous routes. Do not give the baby a medicated pacifier because it could damage the surgical site. Throughout hospitalization, encourage the parents to hold and feed their child. Remind them to give the infant small amounts of water after feedings. Water helps rinse away milk that could otherwise promote bacterial growth. To prevent infection, clean the suture line after feedings. Use cotton-tipped applicators to apply diluted hydrogen peroxide gently to the sutures. Apply a small amount of antibiotic ointment as prescribed to the suture line after cleansing the site. Also, observe for any bleeding around the surgical area. Remember to record the child's intake and output and weigh him daily. Prior to discharge, instruct the parents about long-term management. Discuss resources for the child's speech, hearing, emotional, and dental needs. Help parents understand that their child may need multiple corrective surgeries as he grows into adulthood. While corrective surgery helps many children achieve a normal looking lip and good function, some children do develop long-term complications. Long-term postoperative complications include otitis media and hearing loss, speech difficulties, failure to thrive, pulmonary complications from aspiration, malocclusion due to the abnormal eruption of teeth, and disruption of family life due to multiple surgeries. Also, an older child may find it difficult to relate to other children socially until the malformation is fully corrected.